Good evening, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Scott Lubaroff. I'm the director of bands here at UCF, and I'm so proud to be able to welcome you to this great celebration, 40 years of the Marching Knights, and share uh, just an incredible evening with you and with so many others great people. I've been at UCF since 2017, and, and I can't think of a better place. The amount, uh, the level of the tradition and the level of pride and commitment and engagement that our students and our alumni have with this program and with the great marching nights really, in my opinion, rivals band programs that have been around for decades and decades longer. It's just an incredible sense of community. Our students are the best. You know that because you were a part of this program. And, and it's really exciting to stand on your shoulders and continue to move this program forward. And we all we want is to make our, our alumni proud, make our community proud, support our university and in the best way. So once again, welcome to this tremendous celebration. I'm gonna pop in and out. I've got another talk I've got to get to as well, but I'll be back in with you. But for now, just once again, welcome home. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, to you someone who's been very special to me for a long, long time. And that is our Associate Director of Bands, Director of Athletic Bands, and of course, the Director of the Great Marching Knights, Dr. Tremont Kaiser. Thank you, Dr. Lubrov. We appreciate that very much. And to all of you out there, welcome. We're glad you're able to take some time out of your busy schedules to just celebrate what, the, what you have poured into the Marching Nights for the past 40 years. It's been, a, it's been an amazing 40 years. And this and part of this evening is just being able to just to, to, to talk about uh, the, 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 the trials and tribulations and the highs and the greater highs of of those times. So um, thank you once again, and uh, we're, we're gonna get this thing started, but before we get this started, uh, there's a, another introduction for you. Um, it is, this person has been here for, for quite a long time and, and is also my partner in crime um, as the associate director of the marching band. And so we're delighted to, 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 to be able to uh, moderate this, this session together this evening. So uh, without any further ado, uh, please uh, uh, give us a warm welcome to, to Mr. Dave Schreier, the Associate Director of the Marching Band. Good evening, Marching Knights. <laughs> they told me not to do that and I did it. Um, and fans and, and friends and family, welcome to our 40th anniversary homecoming roundtable. We have some wonderful people that um, are here to share some stories with you. Before we get to that, we have a really uh, incredible announcement. Uh, we we pr premiered the announcement last night, um, but we wanna let you know that the, the Thau family has um, offered to help us raise some money for the marching band by matching, uh, supplying a matching gift of up to $25,000. So um, we want to, to, first of all, thank the Thou family for their support of the Marching Knights. And um, in the, uh, the chat throughout the evening, you'll see some links to where you can help donate and, and help us reach that matching grant of $25,000 if you're so inclined and, and able. So um, and I think that's it's in there now. And, and we'll again, we'll post that a few times throughout the evening. Um, as we begin, uh, I hope you've also had a chance to see our four part video series celebrating the decades of the marching nights. Uh, I wanna thank everybody who contributed to the videos by sending your memories, your pictures, your thoughts. Um, I would like to especially thank our students, Mariah Klinkscales and Andrew Wynn, two of our current marching nights uh, for their incredibly hard work and talent putting these videos together in addition to making sure that we have videos of the band performing for the halftime game since we can't perform on the field right now. Um, but working tirelessly for the past couple of weeks to make sure that we tell our story of the, over the past four days. So if you haven't seen them yet, you should definitely take a few minutes to watch them. You can find them on all of our social media platforms as well as YouTube. Um, they're really just really well done and we're really proud of them. Um, I also wanna let you know very quickly that we do have some special 40th anniversary items that are available. Uh, we have a, a really cool, um, uh, hopefully you can see it, Marching Night commemorative coin commemorating the 40th anniversary of the Marching Nights that you can get as well as other uh, 40th anniversary and Marching Night items. You can find those at shop.ucffans.com. Uh, 
that's the, all the money stuff. Um, tonight we'll be using two features for our audience today. The first feature is in our chat feature, which uh, many of you are using right now, uh, where you can share comments amongst each other, share your excitement for a memory that is shared or anything else. All we ask is obviously to keep it positive and clean. Um, the other feature that you'll use is a Q&A feature uh, that can be found at the bottom of your screen. This is where you can ask questions of the panel uh, that we'll have a few opportunities throughout the evening to, to share. Um, our alumni chair, Jessica Peoples, will be joining us today and she'll be monitoring the Q&A section and she'll pick out a few questions throughout the presentation to ask our panelists. Right now, as we get started, we'd love for you to use the chat feature Please and let us know who's here. Tell, uh, tell us your name, if you're a marching knight or an alumni, what section were you in, uh, the years you marched, if you're a parent, family, friend, or fan, let us know the marching night that you're here to support um, and who, uh, who influenced you uh, to love the marching nights. And now um, it is my pleasure to introduce our panel for the marching nights, 40th anniversary roundtable. Our first guest marched from 2014 to 2017 on Mellophone and was the Mellophone section coordinator. Please welcome Margaret Lamoth. <clears throat> hey, Margaret. Our second panelist marched from 2011 to 2015 on Piccolo and was our Piccolo section leader. Please welcome Alexandria Ayala. We know her as Alex. Our next panelist marched from 1991 to 2001 on trombone, was a section leader, and then from 2002 to 2005 was one of our drum majors. Uh, she's a Driggers Award winner, and I believe was the voice of the Marching Knights for a time. Will you please welcome Laura Young. Our next panelist marched clarinet from 1998 to 2001, was a Driggers Award recipient. We're so happy to have her here. Will you please welcome Ambia Valentine. Our next, there she is. Our next panelist, Marsh Trumpet from 1995 to 1996, 96, 95 to 96. And then from 97 to 99 was our, uh, one of our drum majors. Uh, and then after that, from 2000 to 2002 was our Starlet Night Color Guard Director and also a Driggers Award recipient. Will you please welcome Stephen Porter. Hey, Stephen. Uh, our next panelist, uh, most people, if you were around in the 90s or 2000s, you know this person very well. Um, he's been involved with the band from uh, 1989 to 2010. Marsh Baritone in 89, was a drum major in 90 and 91, was the associate director from 93 to 2005 and director of the Marching Nights from 2006 to 2010 and a whole host of other things. Will you please welcome Ron Ellis? There he is. And there's another person that we all know and love. She marched color guard from 1982 to 86 and also 88 and 89, was a marching night alumni board member and pretty much took out, was the board for um, several years. And since 1998 has been just an integral part of our program as the administrative coordinator, we call her band mom. Will you please welcome Barbara Kelly Hersey. <clears throat> and finally, we're uh, honored to have a founding member with us marching from 1980 to 1983. He's one of our first band presidents and drumline captains, and he's also a Driggers Award recipient. We please welcome Brian Cole. There you go. As you can see, we have a wonderful panel here to share with you and, and share some stories. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it over back to Dr. Kaiser to, to start with our first question. Thank you. you know, we, we just introduced all of you and, and gave a little bit of history uh, uh, with you, with how you've been involved with the Marching Knights. And we'll talk about your experiences more in a bit, but for now, can you tell us uh, what you're doing right now in life? And we will start with Margaret. So right now I am a master's student at the University of Florida. Um, I'm actually studying applied kinesiology and ph physiology, and I'll actually be graduating this semester as a strength and conditioning specialist. Thank you. And how about Laura? Sure. Um, I am currently working for the University of California, Davis. 
Um, I was an academic advisor for graduate students for a long time, but I've moved into the oh so glamorous world of IT. Um, and now I program and design our application system for graduate students. So Margaret, if you wanna get a PhD, you're more than welcome to come out to Davis and you can apply through the system that I put together. Uh, but I'm living out here uh, with my family and um, I'm just so excited to see all of these faces. I wish I could see everybody else's too. Thank you, and how about Ambia? I am currently an elementary school counselor here in Winter Garden, Florida um, at Water Spring Elementary. And I'm actually under, um, the principal is Amy Claver, who is also a formal marching knight and the former drum major. Fantastic, uh, let's go to Alex. Hi everyone, it's so amazing to be here with all of you and my fellow MKs. Um, so the most exciting thing I've done recently is be elected to the Palm Beach County School Board as the youngest member ever and the first Hispanic woman ever to serve. So it's an incredible honor for me to do that. Thank you all so much. And I have to say that I had some pretty great examples of educators some of them right here on this panel with me who led the way to this. So, and also I work at the Palm Beach County Commission serving the residents of Palm Beach County and through this pandemic, we've been there right there with them step-by-step. Step. So that's what I currently do. Thank you, Alex. And how about Steven? Hi guys. I didn't travel too far away. I'm around the corner in the Castleberry Longwood area. I'm a high school dance and color guard teacher. I've been there for about 20 years. And um, actually the principal at my school is also uh, a past drum major, Mike Rice. So we have a lot in common. <laughs> Thank you. And the legendary Ron Ellis. This is so stressful. I just want to get that out there. That's all. Anyway, uh, I'm the director of bands at the University of Texas at San Antonio out here in the Lone Star, COVIDing like everybody else. Um, and this is really one of the coolest things that's happened to me in the last 10 years to be here with these amazing faces. It's so emo right now. Anyway, it's great to be here. And uh, BK Love. Hi, everybody. As Mr. Schreier mentioned, I am the administrative coordinator for the, the Marching Knights and the UCF bands program in total. Um, and the other part of my job at UCF is one of the accountants for the School of Performing Arts. And I just celebrated my 22nd anniversary working for UCF. Wow, that's amazing. And last but not least, uh, Brian Cole. Well, I just woke up uh, being the old person on the call. So I appreciate the, uh, the phone call, Dave, to, to put me in place. Uh, for 36 years, I've been in the student travel industry, primarily those uh, musicians, uh, bands, choirs, orchestras. And being in the hospitality industry, that's all I'm going to say about that. But it's great to see everybody uh, in this roundtable discussion. That's awesome. It's so great to see so many people um, doing just wonderful things and, and the wide variety of, of areas that we all encompass, which is really indicative of the Marching Knights. So we're gonna start talking about the Marching Knights and we're gonna start with the beginnings um, and the first few seasons of the Marching Knights. So we're gonna ask, ask Brian first, um, if you'll talk a little bit about uh, Jerry Gardner and Troy Driggers and the beginnings of our band program. The, uh, the very first time I, I, I spoke with Mr. Gardner. I had gone over to orientation in one of the buildings. I don't even know what it's called anymore. But anyway, uh, the the guy, the counselor walked me over to the, uh, the Department of Music and Mr. Gardner just happened to be on the phone. I said, I'm gonna be in your band. And he goes, what do you play? I'm like, I'm a drummer, good. Look forward to meeting you. Uh, the very first time we all gathered, there were 14 or 15 of us auditioning for the drum line and everybody got a, a part to play. We had enough instruments and we had enough people show up. That was the first thing. Um, and as I put in that video, our, our first, my first recollection or one of the fondest memories was uh, we had done two or three days of drumline camp and getting to know people and learning three different cadences. And so that first morning, uh, everybody started showing up and we were out there playing. Uh, Mr. Gardner, I, I give him so much credit. It must have been extremely challenging 
to come from an established program where he was the associate director at the University of Maryland and to come to Orlando, Florida on a shoestring budget. When I say shoestring, I don't think Mr. Ellis could relate to this, but we had a $5,000 budget that very first year. Uh, we, we, we had uh, no traditions. We didn't know anybody sitting, the person sitting next to you in the stands, we didn't know. We didn't know the person sitting five rows down in the stand. And we, it was just a, a, a baptism by fire, if you will, by uh, getting to know new people who have been in my life for over 40 years. Um, again, going back to Mr. Gardner, he, he had to do it all on his own. He really didn't have a whole lot of help. Uh, I'm not so sure how much support he had from the rest of the staff, or excuse me, the faculty there, because um, you know, it was marching band. It wasn't, uh, it, it was just a, a bunch of people getting together who enjoyed their experiences in high school or community bands and, and anybody that wanted to could come out and be a part of that first year. First game of you all probably have heard, we wore blue jeans and t-shirts. So that was our uniform. And then we had a local uh, store called His for Men that donated polyester pants and some really um, god awful shirts if you've seen those in the old photographs. In regards to my, my, my dear friend Troy, um, number one, he passed away so tragically and, and, and so young. I look back uh, at a, a man who's sitting here who's 58 and a young boy who passed away at 20. I, I can't imagine what he would have been like today, but, but Troy had a magnetic personality and I think each and every one of us knows that type of person when, when they come into our lives. Uh, he had this Southern draw. I, I'd never heard of Wildwood, Florida until I met him. And little did I know he had this Southern draw. You would have thought he came from another state, but um, he was dedicated. He was a hard worker. Uh, he was, um, everybody loved him. Everybody en en enjoyed his, his, uh, his character and the way he was able to handle things. And, uh, like I said, it, it, seems, it seems like yesterday that, that a 20 year old tragically passed away who, who had such, such a bright future ahead of him. So, and I can go on and on and on, but uh, Mr. Schreier said, keep it short, so. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Barbara, um, is there anything that you'd like to add about uh, being a part of, of, of the beginnings of our program and about Jerry or Troy? Um, I, for Troy, it's, I came into the band the year Troy died. Luckily, I was able to meet him. Um, we had started color guard and rifle rehearsals over the summer the year I started. So the entire month of July, we got together and had rehearsals on campus and Troy would come out and he would just be a part of those rehearsals and watch us and talk to us. And especially a 17 year old freshman, me scared to death, nobody I knew made sure to, to come up and say hello and introduce himself. And it's, it's, that's memories that I still 38 years later have of have being able to meet him. And then when we ended that, that month of rehearsals, we had a social gathering at a couple of the color guard members house, at their house and Troy was there. So he just sat around and talked to us and it was, it was really amazing. And Jerry, he, he was so high energy it's going all the time. It's I remember at times where we had to remind him, take your medicine, take a break, take care of yourself. So it's, it's, he was amazing. And the things that he and Troy did to get this band started back in 1980, when going through the records of every student in the university to find out who had band on their application and then reaching out to them to get the band started. It's, that's just the type of men they were. And I wish, we had had more time with them. Wow, what, a, what amazing stories. And, and, and Brian, th th this is for you. And we know how important uh, Troy Driggers was in, in your life when you're all in band together. But you have you graciously volunteered to take the lead to, to charge, uh, to endowing the Troy Driggers Memorial Scholarship. You know, last year at UCF's Day of Giving, we were able to raise about $8,000 towards that scholarship fund, thanks to many of you who are watching tonight. So, Brian, what did prompt you to take the lead on this? And is there any message you want to share about the, the efforts towards this important scholarship? Well, thank you. Um, and as a recipient, I think I was number two uh, in, in terms of that 
recipient. It was a huge honor, especially when it's presented to somebody who knew the person that it's named after. Uh, I, I, what motivated me is it, it's, it's very, it's, it's easy. I was at uh, the, the banquet, what, two years ago, three years ago. And uh, the recipient at that time won the scholarship. And I went up to Barbara, I said, so how much, how much is a scholarship now for the Driggers Award? It's a hundred dollars. Uh, it was a hundred dollars 38 years ago, 39 years ago. And so I just thought, it, 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 you know, it, listen, as time goes on, nobody, nobody knows him. However, getting the award and, and getting some financial support is extremely meaningful for, for everybody. And I just thought a hundred dollars is, is, you know, a, a nice dinner and, and a bottle of wine or something like that. And it, it just, it just didn't seem to keep up with the value of the award when it comes to the monetary thing. So I, I just said, well, this, this we got to work on this. And so I'm, I'm proud to be able to, to offer my assistance and to, to make that a more uh, valuable financial award given to that individual each year. It's just incredible. And we really, really appreciate your efforts toward that, Brian. Thank you for for um, taking the lead on, on that, uh, just an, an important part of our, our program. Um, this was going to be a time where we we're going to answer a question or two from the audience, but I don't see any in there. So if you do have a question, anything you'd like to ask any of the panelists, please use the Q&A function and uh, we will definitely get back to that, but we'll go uh, keep going on for right now. Um, and so our next question is open to anyone uh, who'd like to answer it. Um, Tell us what your first game was like as a marching night, if you remember it, what the feeling was the first time you entered the field for pregame or halftime or, um, you know, whatever your, your biggest favorite memory is of your first time or one of your first times being uh, on the field. Sure, I'll go first. With a last name like Young, I'm never the first person, so I'm going to take my moment. Um, uh, so I feel like when I think about my first year and being teeny tiny little freshman in 1999, I don't know if I remember the very first game, but I remember like my pre-games. I remember standing in tunnels, and I think that's like Oh, I remember everybody talking about the feeling of being under the tunnels before we ran out onto the field. And it like, we ran out onto the field. They brought out some people and they played the call and I just, and the drum line was out there. And then it just went nuts. And we just blasted in from all four corners of the citrus bowl and you're running as fast as you can. And, you know, like everyone in my section was like, and you got to spin on the 25 yard line. So of course you're hauling and you're trying not to fall down and you're out of breath and then you have to go right into pregame and be ready to go. And that was a ton of fun. And just like, it was so different than high school. High school is like, no, you do this and you march on the field and you go, this was like, it was like a rock star moment. So that was so fun. But the other thing I remember about my first year, and I know we have a question that's gonna get us there. So I'm gonna try not to steal too much of the thunder, but we played the rock show, the classic rock show where we had, you know, Queen and we had Carry On Wayward Son and we played it when we went to the University of Florida. And that, that show, and I just have memories of that, like the rehearsals for that show. And Steve Porter was my head drum major. And I remember that we had a move and, and the trombones come right down along the front sideline and we stop and hold for 64 counts. And I am literally staring at Steve Porter's crotch because I'm right on the 50 yard line. And I felt so cool that I was like, yes, right there, so close. I was the most excited freshman ever. And then when, when we start talking about the UF show in 1999, I had no idea what was going to happen. I had no idea what, what Mr. Ellis and what Steve and the other drum majors had cooked up. And all I remember is when we got to that part, it starts happening and we're all just holding a note. And I, I'm, I'm just watching it in amazement as all of this unfolds. And I realize that I'm like hyperventilating because I'm trying to play as loud as I can. So I think what I would say about all of it is just this feeling of excitement and being so cool and being so surrounded by my people. We just, 
oh man, it was so fun. And that's why I marched for seven years. So there you go. That's my first year. That's awesome. Brian? Well, I told you about the uniforms for the first couple of games, but I didn't tell you how we all arrived at the Citrus Bowl. We had to drive individually. There, there was no such thing as a bus. Uh, I'm not even sure how we got instruments down there. I think we put them in the trunk of our cars and we loaded up. It looked like some, it looked like a circus car when everybody piled out and things like that. So it, there was no formal transportation. And then you, you hooked it back over to campus or you went home or wherever like that. The other thing too, you have to remember way, way back, 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 many, many years ago, the drinking age in Orlando and Florida was 18. So we're all 18 year old freshmen in the marching band and, and there's no, protocol i mean we don't know so we go down and grab a beer at halftime or after we're done performing and we sounded so much better after one beer even though we're you know and mr garner didn't say anything because we didn't have any rules or regulations and we weren't doing anything illegal okay let's make that perfectly clear but uh yeah we, we just had to drive there ourselves and uh drive back and then you know a bus no we didn't have anything like that now <laughs> Times have certainly changed. <laughs> um, Ron, this, this question is kind of a follow-up for you. Um, since you were the director during when we went from this, the Citrus Bowl to our on-campus stadium. So what was it like for you uh, leading the band for the first time and seeing them run out of our, our on-campus, what's called the bounce house now, but it's gone through a few names, but what was that like? Uh, it, I mean, I'm sure everybody can imagine how amazing that was. It's, you know, as an alumni in the position I was in and with the ensemble, that's, I guess that's something we'd all dreamed about and we never thought it was gonna happen. I mean, right, Ambia, everybody was like, this is never gonna happen. They're never gonna build that thing. And then it all of a sudden happened so quick. And um, I guess the fun part about the stadium and moving it from downtown to the campus, other than the day shortening by seven hours, it seemed like um, when we had to get on buses and go down there and take your whole life to get to the Citrus Bowl. And then when it would always rain. And so the rain was still there in the new stadium, but at least we didn't have to drive and all that. But anyway, I think the, the, the best part about that was the brainstorming sessions with the student staff um, you know, we were, I think one of the things I'm most prideful about and that we still keep going on out here at UTSA that I really base on everything we did there at UCF was student input and having, letting them have their voice. And I think the fun part from for all that was, you know, hearing how they wanted the game day to kind of unfold and where you wanted to do this and if what we could do over here and all these kind of spots. And so, you know, I, I mean, in the beginning, that, that whole march over was something that, you know, Greenwood and I and a bunch of the student staff had dreamed about forever. We're going to start at the rehearsal hall and we're going to march over and it's going to be the greatest thing ever. And if you were there for that first game, it was literally the greatest thing ever. And then every game after that, it seemed like the temperature got hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter and the march got longer and longer and longer. But uh, I think it was just that the whole thing of capture, trying to capture the essence of having our our on-campus stadium that was just so much fun to kind of plan that around it's so great to see some of that stuff is still around of course stuff is going to adjust and change but it's so great to see that all around but you know it i think it was just maybe the fulfilling of a dream to kind of just put it into a short sentence is that something that we had all wanted for so long and we all kind of had a plan if it ever happens but it's never going to happen and then it happened and then we got to do it and you know, that's kind of a, a pretty awesome experience when you think about it that a lot of us really think back on fondly is that you got to live out that dream. It's pretty fun. That's amazing. So many wonderful stories just about the, 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 the early times. Um, just just remarkable. Uh, you know, and, and this next question is for, for, for the entire panel. And, and I sometimes I think about this as well uh, with not just at UCF, but, but even at, at the institutions I went to. But do, do any of you have any favorite shows? And if you do, could you play that show right now? Okay, I have a favorite show. So my favorite show um, was, was the Star Wars show. And even to this day, I actually don't know very much about Star Wars. But I remember there was a point where we made, and I'm so sorry for any Star Wars fan for what I'm about to call it, um, but I'm going to say like a ship. 
and we moved it across the field like so slow oh my goodness like even not knowing a lot about star wars i remember just marching in the front like with my mellophone and thinking this is awesome <laughs> but no i could not play that show today <laughs> that was the enterprise and that was star trek <laughs> oh gosh <laughs> but star wars was part of the show Star Wars okay, was definitely part of the go. show. So like that whole entity. I guess. Show. <laughs> I'm with Margaret. We were um, at, when we went to Timber Creek High School, we performed it for them at their exhibition, I think, uh, that year. And that was, you felt so amazing because it was a, it was a demanding pace and tempo. And you were like, you know, we didn't really get a lot of like you're weighted at the end of it because it's a lot of fun and you're kind of, PB and Jang, but when you got like, I remember my first year with Dr. Allen, actually, we did, um, was a Spanish show, um, may have been Malagueña, I'm not sure if it was, and it was like fast and intense, and anytime we did one of those, that was my favorite, because you felt like just such a badass, you're like, yeah, I'm here, and I relate to Laura, I came from a competitive program that wasn't super successful we didn't get first place but you were like rigid and you performed and we got to have fun with it at UCF and that was such a change for me but it was a, a welcome positive change to understand that music and performance and that energy that you get from the crowd um th those moments were the best for me and we had a couple of those throughout and also we did one that was um oh my goodness it's like a really popular song by Stevie Nicks or by it was it was like I'll think of it, but it's just the ones where we connected with the audience and they were shouting the lyrics and we were like really aggressive and at a fast pace. Those were always my favorite. Hey, I do want to say just as, as, as the outsider, the first show I ever heard of Marching Nights was when I was in the Carolina band, when I was in the staff for the Carolina band and we came down for the game. And it was the, the 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 Star Trek, Star Trek, Star Wars. Uh, I think it was Independence Day. Uh, you know that show, and that actually uh, shaped my my impression of UCF and helped me fall in love with the university and with with the band program. I have so many favorite shows. Part party show, rock show, Motown show. And just every time we performed it, when we went to an away game and we would play those shows, like the response and the reaction from the home team, they loved us. Like no matter where we were, they would get up and they would dance. They wouldn't, they would be sitting still for their own band. But when we got out there and we played, they were dancing in the, in the stands, which made it even more enjoyable. So those are just some of the memories I have. Party show, Motown show, rock show. Those are all great shows. I could still play the party show, of course, because we play it at homecoming every year. So that helps a little bit, uh, but I could definitely still play it for memory, not having any music in front of me. So definitely some good memories. I definitely loved all those shows, but I think for me, the, um, the pregame, it stands out. I and back from the time when we had the horses that would come down the tunnels and it was like that scary moment in the citrus bowl and you're like is that horse gonna get <laughs> gonna trouble us but um the drill moved as the uh, the sword fight would happen and the sparks would fly from the swords and i just i was like is this really happening i mean we got it it was all explained to us in in rehearsal and i was like but this is really really happening now and so those moments in um the citrus bolt for me were so magical on the morning before the whole audience would get there and all the fans um, to kind of run through all those things and, and see what it was all going to be like. I'll never forget that. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm, I'm going to say as far as performing, the rock show was absolutely my favorite um, because I got to do it twice. I actually did it my first year. And then I think we did it my last year. So my introduction as a little newbie neophyte, we played the rock show and man, that thing brought down the house every time we played it. And then my last year when I was the head drum major, we got to play it too. And I just have very vivid memories of the trumpet section coming up to play, like to just stomp and play for Santana and getting to stand and conduct that. I like that was just so much fun because like I'm trying to hype them up we were at an exhibition show for a high school and I was like punch me in the face I'm like conducting with one hand and yelling at them and I just 
I, I remember just being blown away. It's almost like it fell off of the thing. Um, so I could still conduct it. I'm not sure I could still play it. Um, so I don't know if that's a cop out, but I could still conduct it. Um, and I would say there's another show that is like a nothing show. It's a throwaway show, but it's really special to me. It was, I think it was like the high school invitational day that we did. Um, I think it was my last year in 2007. We brought in a bunch of different high schools to play with us on the field. And the reason that that is so important to me is that my brother is four years younger than I am. And he is a marching night alumni. My sister is eight years younger than I am. And she is a marching night alumni. And it is the only game where we all played together. I was the drum major, my brother was a marching knight, and my sister was the lone person invited from Venice High School to come and be a part of the high school game because I wanted to have that moment. So it was really awesome that like, the marching knights are my family, but my family is also marching knights. And that was really cool to have that moment too. That is that is absolutely amazing. Uh, Dave, what's your favorite show? So we're gonna we're gonna talk about that right now. Um, one like everybody says that that's from that era. The Rock Show will always stand out uh, as as one of the favorites. Um, and I'll I, like and it was brought up already, but I'll never forget performing that show in '99 at UF um, <clears throat> and getting a standing ovation from that crowd, and then um, just walking off that field with everybody just really supportive the uf fan supportive of, of our program and and what we did um i think that was a it might have been a seminal moment for our, for our band to to just get some recognition um but this i, I do have a question for for ron and steve um you guys or, uh, organized this stunt with some flags uh at the end of the show and not uh, to my knowledge none of the band knew about it it just happened and we're holding this note, which might have been the longest note in the history of Marching Knights, as Steve turns around and does this stuff with flags. So, so Steve and Ron, can you share with us um, what that stunt was and how that came about? Steve, you want me to start? Sure. <laughs> Jump in whenever you want. Okay. So, wow, it was great. It was great. <laughs> it, it, it was. It was just great. And well, um, first off, that's a bit, you know, it's a, that's a pretty well-known drum corps bit and marching band bit that had been done before, you know, but, you know, I think I'm a drum corps person. Um, like a couple of people have said, I come from a competitive background and, you know, the, the marching nights was just a totally different thing. That's what kind of made me want to do this whole thing was MKs in 1989 when I first, there's many stories that we can tell. Um, and, uh, and so, well, I guess we're in the middle of this run, you know, I, middle of my time at, at UCF. And, um, you know, we're getting a reputation around town, so to speak, uh, for the shows that we kind of put on, mostly because they're really energetic and they, um, you know, with the culture, we try to reflect kind of the Orlando culture in our shows, meaning, you know, it's Disney and it's flashy and it's over the top and those kinds of things. And so that was kind of the philosophical thing behind the half times. And so... The Rock Show, um, this was not the first time we'd done it, but it was the, I guess, let's say the new and improved version of it um, in that year. And so the bit that we that everybody's talking about is, um, it comes from the Madison Scouts, you know, and Steve March there. That's why one of the things that, it, you know, um, but this was back in the early 80s. And one of the big bits at the end of the show was Madison Scouts got to the end of their show and they held a long whole note and the drum major turned around and took a picture of the audience. And the crowd went nuts, you know, and so uh, it was a contrived moment, that's for sure. Um, but it works. And, you know, Disney, that's kind of thing that we do. And so we got to this, um, we had the show and we did a big Fermata thing at the end and it was good and it was great and we knew it was going to work and we knew the show was going to be awesome. Um, and so Dr. Greenwood and I um, had talked about, he said, is there anything we could do maybe to maybe push it over the top and and I said, well, there's a bit we could do, but we'd have to really take it over the top. I mean, it has to be really over the top. And he said, what's the bit? I said, well, I told him that about that bit. And I said, you got to have the right person on the podium to do it because they have to be able to pull it off because you're going to be in front of 80,000 people and it's going to be packed. I mean, everybody that's in the, in the, in the um, thing today, you can kind of relive this moment. I mean, 
80,000 people there, you're being very scrutinized by a lot of people in a, in a visiting you know, stadium and they're just waiting for something to go wrong. And so um, you gotta have the right drum major. And I knew we did. I knew we had that person there. Um, you need to have a character on the podium that can keep their cool, but still play it up. And so you can see how this is going. And so what our take on the bit, instead of taking a picture is we got, uh, my idea was to get three flags out. Um, one was a UCF flag, one was a Florida State flag, and one was a, a University of Florida flag. And so, and then we swore everyone to secrecy on this whole thing. What was it like Wednesday of that week, Steve, when we told you about it or something like that, you know? And we, and we swore, the three of us, we were sworn to secret, total triple pinky promise. And we said, okay, we don't know if we're gonna do this or not, but here's what we're gonna do. At the end of the thing on that Fermata, you know, we're gonna do one flag and see what the crowd does. And then we're gonna do another flag and see what the crowd does. Then we're gonna do another flag and see what the crowd does. And then you're gonna turn around and you're gonna count the thing off, okay? And so um, uh, I wanna get up to the game and then I want you to tell, I think it'd be great if you tell what it was like on the field and then I'll tell you what it was like from the press box because it was really an epic moment. So anyway, so the big discussion from Wednesday, Thursday to Friday to Saturday of this game week is what order are the flags going to be in? Because we, it's like it's going to be a thing. I mean, should we do Florida first, and they're going to cheer, and then Florida State, then they're going to boo, and then UCF last, and they might boo even louder. You know, it's, so it's, it's this whole thing about what's the order. This is the discussion. What order do you think? What order do you think? What order do you think? And so it was decided that we would do Florida State first. No, no, UCF first. That's right, Steve, right? Was it UCF first? What was it first, Steve? I think it was UCF. It was last, I think. Oh, we Okay. Well, all I know is Florida State, We when, well, you have to tell what you did with the Florida State flag because we did not talk about that. What you did with that, we did not talk about. And so anyway, so we have these three flags. So you see where the bit's going. And so we get to the game and literally at the game on the sideline, literally 10 seconds before we go out, me and Greenwood and Steve Porter there go, are we going to do it? Are we going to do it? Are we going to do it? And Steve, I'll never, Steve I'll, I don't know if you remember this, but... I will never forget this as long as I live. I looked at you and I said, you want to do it? And you went, and we said, all right, we're going to do it. And so we said, do them in this order. And so now I'll turn it over to Steve. So we do the show. The first note's incredible. The band is killing it on the field. It's great. And we get down to the end, Steve Porter. Well, you know, when you put an idea in my mind, I mean, it wasn't like I, I was thinking about it all week and I, I love those dramatic kind of of things. So I, I had it all worked out in my mind. So to back out at that point was was giving in. And I wasn't going to give in. Um, I remember all the other games before that I had worked up. Um, I had watched the, the cheerleaders and they had started doing that UCF kind of stuff into their cheers. And I was like, I had started working it into my salute. So sometimes in the shows before, I would do a thing where um, I would hold the fermata and turn around and and do that. But then when we got the flag idea, I remember, um, well, I won't forget that game, that when I uh, when I threw, <laughs> threw their flag down and held ours up and then everybody went um, berserk, it was, that was a moment I'll, I'll never forget. And it just, it felt like we arrived and it felt like everyone held us to the same level and maybe even more that day because um, we, we sounded amazing. And um, it's, it's, it's so cool. So, okay, let me, let me tell you what's going on in the press box. I'll get this because this will turn into a long story. Sorry. So, okay. so I'm up <laughs> in the press box because I'm announcing then this is before Millhouse and you know, we're doing the whole thing. And so, I'm announcing and the Gator Bands announcer is in there too. And we're behind glass. I always hate, I like announcing when back in the day, but I hated being behind the glass because you you couldn't hear the show. All I remember is the very first note when the band plays Mama, the glass like moved. And I went, okay, they're playing loud today. This is going to be a good show. And then we're getting through the whole show and we get down to the end and Porter turns around. They're holding the note and the crowd is with them. I mean, they're clapping and you've oh. probably been to shows where you see this. They're, they're playing the chord and the chord's loud and the cloud is clapping. So louder. Yeah, yeah. And so he turns around and he does the flag bit and he gets the Florida State flag up and people start booing loud, but clapping. And then he throws it down and like stamps on it. And I'm like in the top going, this is gonna be an international incident. I don't know what's gonna happen. And then he pulls out the UF flag and they just go nuts. And then they pulls out the UCF flag and they go even more crazy. So, and here's what happened then. Then we tell Steve he's gonna cue this, you know, when you goose the note, they're holding a chord, 
loud chord and then he gives it and they go louder so i'm in the press box they're playing the loud chord he does the bit i'm going we're in great shape the show's going to end great he does the goose thing to play the chord louder the glass literally shakes <laughs> i kn- and it was the band and the crowd and so then we get right we're winding the show down we're winding the show down we get to the last note it's a long note the crowd literally stands up from the 50 yard line and starts rippling around in a standing ovation it's the most incredible thing i've ever seen all the way around the stadium but the thing i'll never forget is the announcer for the gator band is i wrote this down when you when you asked me to talk about this um the announcer for the gator band was standing next to me and i'm going to read you what he said because this is exactly what he said he goes oh my god you guys are getting a standing ovation oh my god you guys are getting a standing ovation. Oh my God, this has never happened. I've never seen anything like this. You're getting a standing ovation. He's like cheering as loud as the crowd in there anyway. And so I went, yeah, we're good. And I walked out and went downstairs and it was a great day. Anyway, it was a great bit. Good job, Steve Porter. I also will never forget when we went to FSU and it was a really muddy game and people were slipping and sliding in the mud. And then, but it was the after show where they played a tune and we had one prepared that was so much like them, but it was just like, Every time they thought that they were going to come with something that we didn't have ready, we had one ready for it. It was it was a proud moment. <laughs> That's funny. That sounds like the old uh, battle of the bands between USF and UCF in the, in the day. <laughs> that is so awesome. There's so many. Gosh, there's so many wonderful memories of that show. And 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 not only are there memories of shows, but there's lots of other different types of memories. So this is for everybody and the on the panel and remember this is a family show uh can uh, can any of you uh, a few of you talk about some of your favorite memories that that you can share with us sure if i can remember them uh we didn't have we had band camp the second third fourth year and then from there on and we didn't really have a formal setting per se so after the last afternoon or the last evening we would all go over to Lake Clare. Now, y'all have to remember that there was not an easy way to get to Lake Clare back in those days. There was a dirt path, maybe a road, maybe one vehicle could make it through. It had to be a four wheel drive, but we would uh, hire a DJ and we would go to Skaggs Albertsons, which was now Albertsons or whatever it's called. And we would get a couple kegs of beer and we get a couple bags of chips and everybody would kind of just get to know each other and have a, a great time. Again, we were trying to, establish some traditions and then from there on again i don't know what's happening today but uh each sectional each section after a home game would would host a party and uh, obviously the drum line was always the last for obvious reasons and uh you know it, it was clean it was fun and it was safe that definitely brought back memory the se- sectional parties everybody had some really good parties um a couple of my favorite is just even jam and nights traveling with the Jam and Knights and doing those away games. It was a small group, so we got to know each other and we would we just got to travel so much with the basketball teams. So that was a fun time. And then also getting to go to Sweden um, with the marching nights as well was just a trip of a lifetime and an opportunity for people all over to hear of Orlando, Florida, Disney World, the marching nights and just going and playing that show too. That was just one of my favorite memories. One of my favorite memories um... I'm actually going to share two, but one of them that's really sweet is with the mellophones. Um, the girls, we came together, we made section hair bows, and um, to this day, I still have mine. I still wear it to UCF games, but it was just really special for all of the girls to have it because, like, we had our ball caps on, and, you know, we were like, wow, we don't look super feminine, but having a, a hair bow like in the back just made us feel a lot cuter, I guess. So that was a fun memory of coming together to make them. Um, but aside from that, I would say the Fiesta Bowl, just that whole experience of spending New Year's in Arizona and beating Baylor was just phenomenal. And one of the um, memories that I have was the band used to travel. We always did an out of state trip from the year, at least the year I started. I don't know if if Brian can say that if they were able to do anything prior, Um, but it never failed. The bus would break down. It was just marching night trips. The bus breaks down. Well, we had at that, my, when I first started, we had designated rifle line plus the flag line was, we, we were combined color guard, but it was, you were on the rifle line, you were on the flag line. We didn't do the same equipment. 
And one of the trips when the bus I was on, which was a lot of the flags and rifles, um, we had to get off the bus. And so we posed doing pictures of making it look like somebody was holding us up by one of the rifle player, rifle twirlers getting their rifle and all of us going up against the bus with our hands on the bus, like we were gonna be frisked by the police. And so there's pictures of them holding the rifle up to us as if they were holding us up. And then also on that same bus breakdown, some of the, the KKSI brothers from the trip had a football. And so they decided to just play catch on the side of the road. Well, it ended up becoming catch across the road with cars going by. So it's, it, it was interesting. We had a lot of fun. Nobody got hurt, no cars got hit. So, but it was just, those were some fun memories that I had as a performer. And then um, I know Brian and I are the only ones that are on this panel that got to partake of this, I think, was when we used to have the games at the Citrus Bowl, the next day, Sunday morning, the TBS and KKSI would go back to the Citrus Bowl and clean it. So it was always such a joy to have the smell of the stale adult beverages that were able to be sold in the stadium. We had to clean all of that up, sweep the cups, sweep the food. It was so much fun, but we had, we made fun. We, we made it a fun time by brothers and sisters all being together, spending time and just finding ways to make fun, have fun moments out of something that most people would think is something quite disgusting to have to do. Now, Barbara, if you don't mind me interjecting. Uh, Not at that, all. But that was a fundraiser for the band. Mm -hmm. And it, it was a uh, $500 uh, each time we cleaned the stadium up. Now I know some of you are probably thinking, oh my gosh, the stadium must have been packed with 40, 50,000 people. No, they're probably like 3,000 in the lower bowl between the 30 yard line and the 50 yard line and that was it. I mean, but it, it did bring back a lot of memories. And then what we would all end up doing is we would go to a pizza hut and get some pizzas and sodas. And then that was it for, the, for that Sunday. But yeah, um, 500 bucks, woo we, I don't know what that got us, but, uh, and it was always interesting. I think one year somebody found a diamond ring. You'd always find bottles of something. And this, now listen, this is before there was actually security on the field. This was before you went through security and got padded down. I mean, it was a different time. So people would bring all sorts of, of, uh, of if they didn't like beer, they'd bring their own beverage bottle. And we would line them up and, and just count, count out how many we did. But it was, a, it was a bonding experience also. I have to say that I loved um, Caitlin Money's comment that that is a very KKSI thing to do because it certainly was a KKSI and TVS thing to do. But I, I concur that the times when we would all head back to, um, I know many of you know, we were in the band trailer for a very long time. So when we would head back to our trailer before the fancy, awesome, beautiful new building and performance center that you have now, um, after the game, KKSI would unload instruments and then we would all just kind of hang out, debrief after the game, talk about our favorite part of the show. And just that's where friendships were really built, you know, go to steak and shake or something and go have food after something terrible that I could never eat now and survive the next day. Um, but, you know, that was a big part of it. And for me, band camp was always just so amazing. Um, I was I had the privilege and honor to be on student staff for three of my four years in the marching nights. And I was always so excited and ready to meet our new um, members and have that experience with them all week and be tired and sweaty and just exhausted and exhilarated together. So that was always a super exciting thing for me because that was where relationships were built. And as a freshman, I never I came in and already had a family. I spent a whole week getting to know people who I knew if I was on campus lost or at the pond, I could find someone who would help me navigate my new campus. So those were two memories that I really, really cherish. And um, our band camp experience was so neat. And we got to build those friendships from day one. And I, I don't mind cleaning things up and helping. It's just in so many of us. So that was also a really good bonding experience for me. I think for I me, say, oh, I'll go ahead. No, Whoever was doing that. No, Mr. Ellis, go ahead. Um, it's okay. Well, I'll be really quick. I think for me, um, the time I spent there, I, I think that all the memories, so many great shows and, you know, amazing people and the caring and the MK love and all that kind of stuff. I think it was during that time, it felt like we did a lot of firsts. 
Um, and it, it, it was those moments where you felt like you were breaking through a wall that had been put up, you know, that we all kind of had, I think we all defined ourselves in marching nights from when I joined in 89 till I le uh, came out here in 2009, we all kind of had a chip on our shoulder cause it was all chiefs and it was all gators and it was all hurricanes and it was all that stuff. And, um, I think that those two decades are kind of defined by that chip and then those walls that we kind of busted through and, um, and that's the great thing. And, and that's still, for me, out here even, someone mentioned the Fiesta Bowl. That's a wall that, that the, this generation got to bust through, you know? And um, I celebrated that out here in Texas when that happened. I was like, I'm bawling. And I'm going, I know what that's like. I know exactly what they're feeling. And so for me, it will always be, you know, when you put the energy in to kind of push yourself to do something, do something at the next level and do something different. And that's kind of the energy that characterized those years for me, just breaking those walls down. It was the best. I'll go, I'll go as quickly as I can. I've been listening to everybody and I love that we all have like those little moments. My big moment that is like, how is this a thing? We went to uh, Tulane and we played in New Orleans and the night before the game, the entire marching nights just took over bourbon street and it was it was crazy go nuts so that was just like oh my gosh this is happening um that was a lot of fun and a lot of people could tell you lots of interesting memories from that um on the little personal pieces i totally agree with alex it's the like the little moments of riding home late on the bus after cleaning up being in tbs and singing at the top of our lungs whatever song somebody wanted to sing or you know staying up way too late in a band trailer that smells like what a red dry red or whatever it was the that would suck up all of the sweat because we never laundered the things or making triggers pins you know like we would get out ribbon and we would make triggers pins um but honestly i think that the thing that i love the most and again i i feel like i'm making a lot of comparisons right now between my freshman year and my final year like i wanted more than anything else to be the head drum major of the Marching Knights. And it took a long time, but I did it. And I think one of the reasons that I really wanted to be the head drum major of the Marching Knights was because I remember at the end of every practice, Steve Porter standing up on the podium and saying to us, who are we and where are we from? And like that thing, that last conclusion to everything, to the games, to the rehearsals, to all of it, like I wanted to be the person to get that moment. It was, I love that. I, it makes me feel so special and a part of something that's so much bigger than me. You know, those are all amazing. And it's, it's interesting that, uh, that Mr. Ellis talked about having a chip on his shoulder because I think that is something that the, the Marching Knights still have, that the, the entire program have is that chip on the shoulder, trying to be innovative, trying to be as creative as possible and push the boundaries of music and, and, and marching and just everything that surrounds an actual, not only athletic band program, but UCF bands program. And I think for, for me, it, it really uh, came full circle when, I think it was last year when another band director came came over to me and said hey just let you know there's a lot of us band directors in the state that think that that there are that there are two great marching bands in the state and that is that is UCF and FAMU and when I went when I heard that I thought okay well that's that's great but we we still have that chip we still have a lot of work to do and and Thanks to, to, to all of you for having that chip on the shoulder, because it wasn't for y'all having a chip on the shoulder. I don't think that we would have that chip on the shoulder. So I know there's more questions we have to get through, but I thought I'd just throw that in there. Sorry, Dave. <laughs> That's fine. Um, Jessica, we're going to go to you. I know you've got a question for Mr. Ellis, so if you will share that with us from the, the Q&A section. Sure. So um... Talking about the 90s, uh, Ron, can you share about composing the new fighting song? Don't look so excited. Okay, good. That's a good question. Okay. <laughs> there could have gone so many directions. Um, okay, so, well, I mean, it's, um, there's, that's an interesting story. Uh, I, I'll try to do it as quick as possible, but that's an hour project. Um, the, uh, the, the fight song um, that we were playing when I, when I got to MKs, um, 
I didn't know anything about it or anything like that, but I played it and it was this song and all that. And then um, one day, um, I think I was watching TV and the University of Minnesota was uh, playing a football game or a basketball game or something like that. And they're playing their fight song and um, and it sounds really familiar. <laughs> so um, there was, I, for those of you, the youngins in here, there was no internet back then. There was no uh, uh, iTunes or no YouTube. You couldn't go read. You had to like find out and make phone calls on a thing that's connected to the wall. It's crazy. Um, and so we found out that this fight song that they chose, and this happens in a lot of places. This is not, this was not just a UCF thing. This happens in a lot of places. A lot of high schools play other colleges foot uh, fight songs and that kind of thing. And so um, we found out that the that the Minnesota fight song was actually the one that that the Marching Knights were playing. And for whatever, yeah, the Minnesota Rouser. And um, and so the uh, we were going. It, it Rick Greenwood. We were talking, and he goes, "We gotta make it a fi- our fight song. What's gonna happen if we ever meet it with Minnesota in a game? Because it's gonna happen. We're getting bigger, fast, and here we go." And so. A decision uh, the decision was made to I'll, I'll try to make it funny um, the decision was made to to keep the lyrics the same and to adjust the I'm saying adjust the fight song I guess rewrite it um, and so the fight song was rewritten on an airplane going to Europe um, when we were doing the uh, a- the ambassadors of music tour with dr. Bruner and um, we were taking high school students over to that to, to Europe for 15 days. And so we sketched it all out on the plane flying to Europe. This is literally four weeks before band camp. And so came back, we orchestrated it, did the whole thing. And I'm just the orchestrator guy. I'm just orchestrating it, arranging it, passing it out. This is what we're going to do. The band's on board. The band's on board. We're going to do this. And so uh, what, what, hap- what forgot, what didn't happen was nobody told anybody that we were doing it. And so the, we got to the part in the pregame and they said, and now the UCF fight song. And we started playing the song and nobody clapped because nobody recognized it. Cause uh, apparently it was not conveyed up line that we were going to change the fight song. So I'll leave it at that. It is the same one we did, but uh, it was an interesting couple of days after that game uh, when we did that. That's awesome. Well, we are getting close to our time, and I know there's a big event nationally that we want to make sure that we give everybody that's interested a chance to go see. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna cut to our, our last question. Um, but before we do that, I want to first of all make sure that we thank all of our panelists. Thank you guys so much for sharing your your time with us as we celebrate our 40th anniversary, and thank you for the foundation that each of you have laid for the program that we all love. We also want to thank our alumni and current members. It's so great to see all these names that are sharing stories in the chat as we go through. Um, But thank you to all of those that are watching um, for all you've done and are doing to continue the tradition of excellence that we've been fortunate to to cultivate through the years. Um, I also want to give a special thank you to all of the those who have held the title of director or associate director of the Marching Knights um, for their leadership and the contribution to their band. Uh, to our band. Um, and um, finally, I want to uh, make sure that I thank Dr. Kaiser uh, for his leadership and passion during the last five years as we continue to move our band program forward. Uh, it's really my honor to have the opportunity to work with you um, and help you uh, bring the band to new heights and on the shoulders of all the people that we see here and those that aren't with us anymore. Um, so here's our last question for the evening. And tonight's about, uh, this is about the future. We've talked a lot about the past, but this is about the future. And this is for all of our panelists. Um, What is your hope or your wish for the Marching Knights as we move into the next decade and beyond? And uh, we'll all actually ask in in, in this order. So Margaret, I'll ask you first. My hope is for the Mellophone section to always be the loudest and the biggest and the best. Um, (laughs) But aside from that, I just... I hope that MK's continues um, to grow seriously. I know that it was a a big family for me when I was an undergrad and a lot of my best friends now are the people that I met in MK's. And so I just hope that every incoming marching night or every marching night that is in the band now just feels that loving experience that I felt. And I I hope that it just um, follows them wherever they go as they reach for the stars. (laughs) That's awesome. Alex? 
Yes, Margaret, reach for the stars. Um, my hope is that I continue to see the the band become continue to be and become the renowned number one band program in the state of Florida and one of the best in the country. And that when I go to our beautiful campus, I get to see the presence of the band all throughout. Um, the presence of the building was, I think, one of the huge biggest goals for me to know that we have a home and know that we have a permanent fixture that we now get to call our home. Um, and I, I just hope that I get to continue seeing the membership grow, the traditions grow. Um, I get to welcome new faces every time I get to go back, hopefully in person next year to perform with all of you and all of the all of you watching. And that I just get to continue to be a part of something. I, I hope that one day I'm I'm the Brian in this chat, getting to look back at my last 40 years and continue to see those after me who have carried on our traditions and made the Marching Nights uh, the best band program in the state. I love that. Uh, Laura. Stole my answer. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I think I agree. Um, like, I, I really hope that the program continues to find a way forward that continues to like, I wouldn't say reinvent, but like keep the identity of the Marching Knights to be like this cutting edge band that does things that other bands don't do, right? I love that we were the band that had fun, that we were the band that ran on the field. And, you know, the fact that that you guys have managed to maintain that kind of identity of, of even if, you know, certain things have to change or shift, you're still the fun band. I, I really hope that maybe the offense slows down just a little bit so that when I watch on TV, I can hear more band playing in between football downs. Um, I, I do. I really hope that that even though it progresses and moves forward, I hope that they still maintain that sense of like what made it so special for all of us. Um, and I hope that, you know, for everyone who comes in that, yeah, they do, they inherit a family or they find their family. Like I said, my brother and sister are both marching nights. I met my wife in the marching nights. I have two kids. I have gone to multiple marching night weddings. Like I hope for that for the future too. I hope that this family stays united as it grows and that it like this can continue to bring people together in the ways that it has. That is just awesome. Ambia. I don't know how I can follow all of the things that everybody has already said. Um, I agree with what everybody said. Um, you know, I just want to say for the current marching nights and all the marching nights who are watching today, the alumni, it's true. We are family and it doesn't matter how long ago you marched or if we're currently marching, just the bond and um, knowing that we all went through this together. That's just something that keeps us connected. And so I just think it's great that I have friends that I met 20 years ago that are still my friends today, some of my best friends that I hang out with, and it's all because of the marching night. So the lasting friendships, it just I think that that's important. And I, my hope is that the marching night's current, future, um, remember the friendships that they make today because it's gonna last them a lifetime. Steve, Steven. To tail on what you were saying, Ambia, that um, like these days I'm seeing, students come through the marching band programs that are kids of people that we went to school with. <laughs> so it's like, whoa, this is, it all turned around on us. But um, every time I'm on campus, uh, it's crazy to me how much the university has grown since I was there. And that makes me really proud. But, um, but to, as much as we grow, to never forget how special and intimate it felt when we first came into um, the Marching Nights and how special it is to a person who came from a high school. And no matter how great they were, it's nothing like that moment that you are surrounded by that section that is amazing. I'll never forget. I came in and I thought I was a good trumpet player, but then there was 60 trumpets around me that could play circles around me. And that when I walked in the door and it's like, whoa, I hope that that groundbreaking moment is there for each person who comes even today. That's great, thank you. Um, we're gonna skip around just a little bit. Brian, if you will share some thoughts. Well, um, I'm gonna go a little different because we all know the value of friendship and the memories and traditions. I, I will say, having had the opportunity to personally know each of the directors of the Marching Nights for the past 40 years, uh, the, the current staff that we have in place, Dr. Kaiser, Dave, the program's in excellent hands. It's, it's, it's not a matter of uh, building the program any larger. It's not a matter of adding more excitement. You, all, you already have that aspect. 
I'm going to go a little bit different. I, you know, there's so many things that, that the program could use outside of its normal budget. And as, as you get a little bit older, you reflect on where you came from and all the memories. And then when the finances allow you to do that, consider the marching nights. I mean, I know that we've been trying to get lights on that field. Maybe one day it'll be artificial turf. Maybe one day it'll be enclosed. Um, and and, and that, that could be the next legacy. That can be the future, whether it's a year, five years from now. But if the opportunity presents it to all these, all the alumni, marching night alumni, as you mature and you get older and you start looking at different things to do, um, I'm sure the, uh, the association would welcome anything and everything that you could do to expand on the program, whether it's additional instruments, whether it's, like I said, lights or the amenities, the amenities that, that, that make it extremely special. Great, thanks, Brian. Barbara. Um, I, I really, as everybody else has said, and I completely agree with Brian, it would be wonderful to see lights on the field. Um, I pay the bills, so I know what we pay for lights on the field right now. So it'd be, it would be nice to see almost more recognition from the university and more appreciation of what this ensemble provides to this university and to this community. And get a bigger band building. We outgrew that band building before it was even done. So we're still having to use facilities to store things. So the lights on the field. But the biggest thing is that those that come in after I'm retired, after we're all long and gone, is that they keep that family environment. We grow in size. I mean, from when I first started in 1982 to where the band is now, it's huge, we're more than doubled. And that's amazing. And I wanna to continue to see that growth, but at least to where it's manageable, manageable for the directors to put a high quality performance on that field and not just fill end zone to end zone. And as we've seen over the decades, the number one reason of everybody joining and staying with the marching nights is that MK love. And that we continue to instill that into all of these new babies that are coming in to this ensemble so that that is, is something that stays with this band forever. Thank you, Barbara. And Mr. Ellis. All that, um, no, I, all that, but I, I think um, I would, as the band person here for uh, Dr. Ubroff and uh, Kaiser and Schreier, um, scholarships for these kids and we got to get them a turf field and we got to get them some lights and uh um i i think the from from a distance and following it and talking to one of my best friends uh dave over the years it's been great to see how the the university and the athletic department has kind of uh, moved to a more supportive role than it was i in my memory <laughs> um that's been really really great i think the next step is what brian said is uh getting some infrastructure um acknowledging the impact that um that this kind of ensemble and this kind of organization has on students. It keeps them in touch for alumni relations. It, um, it represents the university much more than they put into it money-wise. So I think that that's a thing. Um, and then I, you know, more of this, more of this. Um, my, my, it, my challenge to the alumni and the people that have gotten out of the, the band and are doing these amazing things with these amazing people is remember and hire the people that are in this band and find them jobs. That's the legacy that we always dreamed about and uh, it's happening. And I think you're, we're at the forefront of it. And it's so great to have these people running this program that I was so privileged to be a part of for so many years and gave me everything, uh, everything. Um, and so that would be my challenge to everybody is just remember these kind of feelings, do more of this and uh, do your best to keep it in the family and everything will be as it should be. So awesome stuff. Thank you so much. It's it's just been an absolute pleasure to to hear from everybody and see so many friends um, here and, and and watching on the the screen as the the chat rolls by. Um, so I'll turn it over to Dr. Kaiser to to close this out. But again, thank you to everybody for giving up some of your time and and sharing a bunch of your memories and and some MK love with us tonight, Dr. Kaiser. Oh yes, it has definitely been such a pleasure and honor to listen to so many stories and 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 I, I learned quite a bit throughout throughout tonight's discussion. And it's it's amazing that that you all talk about some of the same things that that we even talk about today from everything from having a chip on the shoulder to loving one another to 
making sure the three eyes stay intact as we as not only as we go throughout the season, but taking going taking them with you in everyday lives. And and you all have been a remarkable example of of the three eyes and and the students that are watching right now definitely have a great exemplar for when they go into rehearsal tomorrow or in the performances tomorrow um, of 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 who they can who they can be. So and each of you, thank you very much. To those of you who have donated to the program, thank you so much. Um, to the, the, the Thal family, to Brian Cole for everything that you've done. Um, we just appreciate what you have done to make sure that we get some of the scholarships that, 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 we're, that we're looking for. And, and, it's, and it's my hope that here over the next uh, five years that we're able to endow several more scholarships, but then also be able to, to get lights on the field. And we have students in the band that, that are working on that you know, as we speak through, through student government. So uh, every, every, everybody's working very hard and we're definitely fortunate and honored. And most importantly, I uh, want to like to say thank you to Mr. Schreier. Uh, Mr. Schreier, of course, all of you know, has been the, the nucleus, the glue. He has been the two by four. He's been the nails. He has been, um, he, he has been the scotch tape for, you know, for, for, for all of us over the years. And not only that, but he is truly the brainchild to this, to, to this panel discussion tonight. I know that this past summer we talked about um, what we wanted to do for this for this semester with us being in a COVID year, and we did talk about alumni series. And I thought about it just during for accolade, and and that happened. But then after that, you know, Mr. Schreier said, "Let's let's take it a step further. Let's let's bring our alumni back and have them talk not just during accolade, but but during homecoming." and and so him putting this together has truly been inspirational. So um, if you can give a virtual round of applause and thank you to, to, uh, to Mr. Schreier, AKA the Godfather, uh, that, would be, that would be absolutely fantastic because, because without him, we would be five years behind. So thank you, Mr. Schreier for what you've done. Also to previous directors such as Mr. Ellis, also Dr. Greenwood, uh, Professor Gardner, um, just uh, um, Dr. Tobias. I mean, there, there's so many. There, there's so many directors in the past that Dr. Lubroff and I are able to, to to stand on and say thank you, and most importantly to our alumni, thank you very very much. So it's 8:54 in this time zone, Laura. I know that you have a little bit of time. It's still sunlight out there, so it, so so enjoy your beautiful sunset. <laughs> And um, please shoot us an email, send us a, send us a, put something out on Twitter or, or Instagram or whatever your favorite social media uh, platform is. And hopefully we will see everybody soon. So enjoy the evening. Go Knights. Charge on. <laughs>